pandemic took a particularly heavy toll on restaurants, with tens of thousands shutting their doors for good. Special correspondent Fred DeSam Lazaro visited one unusual establishment that's bucking the trend and reviving Native American food traditions that disappeared after European settlement in North America. It's part of Fred's series, Agents for Change, and our arts and culture series, Canvas. The city of Minneapolis has its roots in flour milling, its Mississippi riverfront today dotted with icons of that heritage. But a new centerpiece of this historic district is an enterprise with a very different take on that history. There was a really important Dakota village right here on this side of the river where our restaurant sits. So for us, you know, it's an act of reclamation because we're able to bring the true namesake of this space back. Okay, right down here. Yeah. That namesake is Sean Sherman's restaurant called Owamni, swirling water in the Dakota language, and named after the much higher waterfalls that existed before industrialization brought dams. For Sherman and his life and work partner Dana Thompson, the restaurant opening was timely, broadening the conversation about racial equity in a city still recovering in the aftermath of George Floyd's murder. The fact that it happened, you know, during a pandemic, after the uprising and all of the different layers of complexity, um, it's been a really important uh, place to heal, to, to have space, to have these really hard conversations about race and culture and food and equity and sustainability. The more immediate conversation, however, has been about the food. The verdict is, wow. Amazing flavors. That's amazing. Mm -hmm. Delicious. Wamni's wide array of ingredients has some that have been revived after generations, and all of them are pre-colonial. That means no chicken, no pork, no dairy, and in a city that calls itself the mill city, no wheat. And we're just trying to keep it really simple. Sherman says his recipes combine simple flavors and texture. Rabbit on a bed of kale, venison tartare, braised bison garnished with dandelion greens. Simple perhaps, but good enough to earn a nomination for best new restaurant from the James Beard Foundation. From patrons we spoke with, two thumbs up. It's naturally gluten-free and dairy-free, and the food was just absolutely spectacular. Yeah, I'm excited about Native people reclaiming their heritage and sharing it with us, because we have a lot to learn from the people who were here before us. Or relearn, says Matthew Tutimez, a diner from California. In Los Angeles, we've been so removed from our um, ability to have our indigenous foods that we could not have a meal like this. He's a biologist for the Kitch Gabrieleno Band of Mission Indians in the Los Angeles Basin area and was thrilled to see things like corn that's been nishtamalized or treated in an alkaline solution. It's a process that our tribe did for thousands of years. And what this is, is actually within grains such as acorn, such as corn, they have a, a layer that needs to be removed. So in order for this product to actually be nutritious, you have to remove that. Every tribe had this component. It was like our chicken soup. A far cry from conditions across Indian country today, says Sherman. You know, our focus is indigenous communities. So, you know, some of, some of these communities can have upwards to 60% type 2 diabetes because of the nutritional access that they have around foods. Well, Wamni is the latest chapter for Thompson, whose heritage is Dakota, and Sherman, whose Oglala Lakota, and their Sioux Chef Enterprise, as in S-I-O-U-X. Do you want me to sign this book for you? His cookbook with that title won a James Beard Award in 2018. They also run a nonprofit that includes the Indigenous Food Lab, providing education and training. Wherever possible, they source from and help create new tribal suppliers like all of our bisons coming out of Cheyenne River, and we're getting a lot of fish from a couple of the northern Anishinaabe tribes like Red, Red Lake and Red Cliff. Um, and we're just really trying to create a demand. We're continuing to build them up. That's a big core part of our nonprofit, is um, acting as an entrepreneur generator. Someday, those entrepreneurs could include staffers at Owamni, where indigenous people are in the majority. We had about a handful of our quinoa. 
Daryl Montana moved here from Los Angeles initially just to train at the nonprofit. Then he was offered a job here. So I basically uh, packed up everything and moved to Minneapolis for this uh, unique and uh, exciting opportunity. What do you see yourself doing in 10 years or 20 years? I would actually like to you know, to keep spreading the word about our indigenous meals and our indigenous chefs and our indigenous cooking, going back to what our forefathers grew up on, what they foraged, what they hunted, how it was a hundred times more healthier than what they're eating now, processed and sodium-based, uh, just unhealthy food. I'm going to plate it right now, so I'm ready to go. Eddie Lone Eagle is another alumnus of the Indigenous Food Lab. I'm Ojibwe from Red Lake, Minnesota. Growing up, I always wanted to make uh, indigenous food, so I really didn't know much about it. You know, I, I just cook it with pride. Alexa Wyatt, whose heritage includes Shawnee and Paw Paw, is the events manager at Owamni. Bringing my grandmother up here from Oklahoma, that happened a few months ago, and I watched her cry when she was eating one of the dishes, and she's like, this reminds me of when I was a child. And we're just kind of setting forth a path of how we can steward indigenous knowledge, reclaim indigenous knowledge, and practice it in real time, um, and be a role model for what that looks like right now today, and doing it through something as simple, I wouldn't say simple, but something like a restaurant, which is far from simple. <laughs> <laughs> it's a heavy lift. New restaurants, like most small businesses, have a high failure rate. At Owamni, so far so good, say Thompson and Sherman. There hasn't been a day since opening last July that they've not been fully booked. For the PBS NewsHour, this is Fred DeSam Lazaro in Minneapolis. Yum, that's all I can say.